So I admit it, that I hold grudges, but I have reasons to. When I was 12 years old, my favorite karate coach, Pero, came to my home with an AK-47, shouting, you have one hour to leave or be killed. He took my dad and older brother, Eldon, to a concentration camp. This was the spring of 1992. My mother, Adisa, was a pretty red-headed neatnik who worked at the clothing company. While my father, Keka, was a well-respected athletic trainer, the unofficial mayor of our town. We were shocked when our Christian Serb classmates and neighbors turned on us overnight and all of a sudden wanted us dead just because we're Muslim. My name is Kenan Trebinčević. I was born in 1980 in an Eastern European town called Birchko. My family was exiled in the Balkan War and came to US in 1993 when I was 13. I became an American citizen in 2001, and I got my degree in physical therapy at the University of Hartford in Connecticut. Living in Queens, New York, I consider myself a regular guy, more into soccer and Seinfeld reruns. Yet, the minute I decided to visit my former home, I had eventual fantasies of confronting my old friends who betrayed me. So my memoir, The Bosnia List, chronicles my family's escape from the ethnic cleansing campaign that swept the former Yugoslavia. After two decades in America, my father desperately wanted to visit Birchko again, so Eldon and I agreed to take him. While vacation for normal, single, 30 old American guy meant parting romance, I wrote a list of 12 items. It included people I wanted to avenge. Still being so angry at my karate coach, on top of my list was to stand at Pera's grave to see if he was really dead. Last time I saw him, he was laughing at me, pointing his gun. But soon after that, I learned that he was shot to death by one of his own. And he was 30 years old, the same age I was when I returned to Bosnia. So this photograph was taken in 1990, when I was 10 years old, the day I received my blue karate belt. And you can see Pero standing above me with his arms draped over my shoulders. Fast forward was three years later, Pero found himself a new home at the cemetery. This is the concentration camp he took my father and older brother to. The picture on the left was taken in 1992 when BBC came to report the atrocities. However, they couldn't find any prisoners because they shipped them to another camp. The picture on the right I took in 2011. Because coincidentally, when I was putting pictures together, I came across the picture on the left. So I decided to superimpose them. I thought they were pretty cool for what they are. While there, I was still, I kept reliving the horrible year when we were the last Muslim family in Birchko trying to escape. The first time I made a bread run, a bullet nicked my forehead. On the way back, my favorite teacher, Milutin, stopped me and he shoved his rifle barrel against my head. So that photograph was taken in celebration of 1986 Republic Day holiday in which my favorite teacher, the laser doesn't work, picture in the top left-hand corner, made our first grade class swear and pledge that we'd always defend the brotherhood for which our country of Yugoslavia stood for. On that day, we were to wear traditional blue hats and red scarves representing Tito's pioneer. Tito was an old dictator who kept uh, old ethnic groups from killing each other for 40 years. However, on that, way to, on that day to school, my dad stopped me and said, hold on a minute. He's like, take that thing off your head. I said, why? Other kids are wearing it too. He said, you don't understand, you're too young. I don't want you taking a picture with a hat. So I didn't. So I'm standing in the top row with my I'm fifth from the left. I remember this story only when I was putting the pictures together for the book, and it came back to me. I recalled the conversation with my dad, and that's when I really realized what he meant by the comment he made, not explaining it to me. My family finally made out of Bosnia in January 1993, sneaking onto the last bus to Austria. We lived in Vienna as refugees for 10 more months. There I won a contest in an international Bosnian newspaper in which I unloaded my hurt and anger in form of essays and pictures about what my friends did to me, including the coach. So many of our refugee friends dispersed throughout Europe were able to read the article and that's how they found us. My mom was so happy she hung me and gave me pastry. And then an interfaith council of churches and synagogues sponsored us to come to the States and we wound up in Connecticut as foreigners with little English and $300 in our pocket. Our immigrant story was living in 
rented apartments filled with donated mismatched furniture. But my dad refused to be on welfare. So for six yards a week, he painted houses, flung poetry at Boston Chicken, and punched a clock at the fruit cup factory while mom drove herself from chemotherapy she needed. And then in junior high, I was afraid the big, rich American kids would, would make fun of my accent, grammar mistakes, and skinny frame hidden in warm clothes that logged 4,372 miles. When everyone said on the first day of school, hey, Kenan, out loud, I felt like a stray dog in humane society waiting to be adopted. But luckily, Catholic Spaniard King Miguel befriended me. He offered me a desk nested next to him. At lunch, he shared his tater tots with ketchup, my first American food. <laughs> then he put me on a ride bus, bus home. He taught me how to play baseball and football, which I never played before. But he was the worst sport I've ever met aside from me. But then joining a local soccer team, my teammates guessed the reason I outran everyone was because I had to run away from bullets in Bosnia. So my nickname was Bosnian Bomber. <laughs> and then when we played uh, American football, they just told me to run and fly and just keep running. So I did. <laughs> when we won the championship, I jumped on the back of the coach, Ted Papadopoulos, a Greek giant who handed me MVP trophy with my name engraved. And that was the first uh, time I connected, reconnected with a coach since Old Terra. When I was in high school, I wanted to watch my favorite movie, Back to the Future. Cars don't fly. There's nothing you can learn from that, Mom said. She insisted on watching her favorite movie, Schindler's List. I said, oh God, Mom, another genocide movie. And while watching it, she said, oh, this is exactly what happened to us. This is our story. And I looked at her, being a resentful teenager that felt lost everything. I said, what do Jews and World II have to do with us? She said, Kenan, you should never forget those who did us harm but you should always remember the good people too and anyone who did any good deeds for us. And I looked at her and I said, fine, you thank them, but I can probably count one finger, all of them that helped us. Let's fast forward two decades later, while I finished in the book, I wrote a new list of all the Christian Serbs who helped us escape Bosnia. There was a Serb soldier who filled our propane gas tank and snuck food to us at night. A bus driver who waited for us in the blizzard while checkpoint guard was contemplating whether he was going to execute us. And then a police chief, also named Pero, who wrote us papers and saved my dad from going to another concentration camp. So in my child's mind, I labeled my karate coach as bad Pero and good policeman, good Pero. Then three years ago, I had a physical therapy patient named Susan, who was a journalism professor, always grading stacks of essays. Is your assignment what I did on my summer vacation? I asked her sarcastically. She said, no. First assignment I give to my students is to write three pages about your most humiliating secret. I said, you're Americans, I laughed. I'm like, why would anyone reveal that? She said, well, because it helps you heal and editors like unusual voices. So that unlocked something within me. I went home, I wrote three pages. So the first three pages I wrote and rewrote wound up in the New York Times. Next time during her physical therapy session, she said, why don't you try a three-page flashback scene? I said, no one can remember that. But next time I gave her 43 pages, which came pouring out of me. After my Penguin book editor read my proposal, she said, man, I admire your ability to hold grudges for so long. <laughs> I'm so good at holding grudges myself that I even held them on behalf of others. But that's when I knew I was in good hands. But I didn't want to write another academic and political book, strictly, because there's so many written out there. I want to tell a story of a 12-year-old boy juxtaposed with perspective of 30-year-old American citizens at a time, caught in the war. But I feared that I didn't have a right to talk about the Balkan battle. I wasn't a hero or a soldier like my cousin Mirza, who fought for four years. He later told me, Kenan, the only reason I got out of there alive was because I didn't want to die a virgin. <laughs> but he said, on a seriously, serious note, after I read my book, this is the first time in 20 years I felt like a winner. And you've done more with this book than I could have done with my rifle. And someday you'll realize that. In the first chapter, I wrote that because I had to leave Bosnia at 12, I never kissed a girl from home. But since the publication, I received some lovely offers <laughs> to remedy that from beautiful, beautiful Balkan women from over the world. <laughs> and even a better perk than mom's pastry. I'd like to thank everyone here for listening to my story. I'm a, still, I'm a person who still holds grudges. Resentment probably will never disappear. 
Yet, reliving what happened to me, visiting my homeland, reuniting with my family, and giving my younger generation the voice, I started to see my past differently. While I always be proud to be Bosnian, I adjust my double identity, and I'm so privileged to be in the field as an American. Because this is a country that gave me a second chance. So I'm finally beginning to feel more lucky than bitter. My mother always wanted to tell a story of her survival, but she was too sick to do it before she died. She used to tell me, can you please stop bouncing the basketball and, write a book and read a book for once? <laughs> well, she'd be happy to learn that I've written our story and dedicated it to her. Thank you.